How's it going guys? Today is episode 48 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series and you may have a couple questions. Firstly, didn't the rapid rating climb series already end when I hit 2000 ELO? Technically yes, however after reading several comments and having some conversations with some of my subscribers in my discord, I think it might be interesting to try to push towards 2100 because as the competition gets tougher and tougher, I think it makes for some very interesting games, and I hope you guys agree with that. Secondly, you may be asking, wait, I thought you hit 2000 ELO, why is it 1995? Well, for that, I'd recommend checking out episode 1 of my playlist, where I play against my subscribers, which are also members of my Discord server, In and I lost against... Um, one of the guys in episode one of that incredible game uh check it out it's absolutely awesome um fair play to jiten jiten i think is how you pronounce it i pronounced it wrong like the entire video so apologies and so basically we're going to be continuing the rating climb series and seeing if i can get to 2100 we're not going to do this every single day we're going to intersperse it with some other types of videos but i think we should keep it going and i hope you guys agree with that and also enjoy it with that being said let's get into the game all right so i'm just going to play my opening move so the game doesn't get aborted but real quick for those of you who are seeing the channel for the first time my name is alex and this series is basically about playing rapid games on chess.com with the well the initial aim was to get to 2000 elo but i guess the updated aim is 2100 elo and the main goal is for me to try and talk you through my thought process while i play so that you can understand what i'm thinking and hopefully it can imp help you improve at your own game and then use the post game analysis to delve a bit deeper into some of the ideas see where i went right see where i went wrong and where the computer can help us to well help me improve my game and therefore you can get some better ideas so d4 c6 i'm setting up a sort of slav system if my opponent goes c4 the reason i play c6 instead of d5 on the first move because if like d4 d5 knight f3 c6 we get the same position as we just gotten in the game the reason i play c6 first is because i want to give white the option of playing e4 and going into a karo khan which is one of my favorite openings because if I go d5 straight away, white doesn't have that option. And I really like the Karo Khan. I've got playlists on my channel dedicated to the Karo Khan defense, where I've played with it and against it, because it's an opening I love. And I also have uh, an opening playlist where I play the Slav defense, which is what this is. Technically, it's not the Slav defense until my opponent plays c4, which he might not do, but I'll consider it a Slav. And many of the ideas overlap with the Karo, but it's not quite the same if white doesn't play e5, which is why I think it deserves a separate playlist, although many of the ideas overlap. So my opponent isn't interested in developing this bishop to f4, which is very typical and sets up more of a London idea. So he plays e3 and he's blocked his bishop in. Bishop g4 is probably the most natural move in the position. Although we can play knight f6 as well. I'm going to go knight f6 just because it's a little bit like less, um, oh, what's the word? Committal. Like I'm not committing where I want to put this bishop yet. I might want to put it on f5. I might want to put it on g4. I'm not sure. And I think this is actually a collie system. Uh, C-O-L-L-E. Collie system. And I guess the idea. I haven't actually played against the Collie that much, but I guess the idea is just not to develop this bishop outside of the pawn chain. Just get a good grip over e5, and I guess you save a move by not developing. If any of you play the Collie, then please let me know like what the idea is instead of developing this bishop playing e3 first. I'd really be interested to know, but we might see that in this game. So now my opponent's kind of made my decision for me. If I'd have gone bishop g4 on this move, he might have played bishop e2 and um, ensured that I don't pin the knight to the queen. Whereas in this position, where my opponent has already committed his bishop to d3, 
then we can go to g4 and bring in the back bishop back to e2 would be a waste of a move and in the same vein if my opponent had gone bishop to e2 i probably would have gone bishop to f5 so i can dominate this diagonal and if my opponent plays bishop d3 again he's wasting a move so he defends the knight i'm kind of expecting him to go for moves like c4 b3 and bishop b2 to justify this setup um Knight bd7 is a valid move. e6 is also... I think knight bd7 I want to play, though, with the idea of going e5, because this knight is not actually controlling e5, because it's pinned to the queen. Okay, so he attacks our bishop. There's no need to take this. Of course, you can take, and after a move like knight takes, play e6, and be ultra solid on the light squares and claim that you don't mind losing the light squared bishop because your pawns are replacing the light squared control totally valid way to go about this position i see a few comments every now and again suggesting that g4 now typically in the caro khan this is not a great way to play for white so i'm gonna assume it's also not that great in the collie because I'm challenging his bishop now right if he takes then we take with the h pawn and my rook is a monster these pawns aren't scary if he goes for a move like g5 my knight just comes into e4 that's not a problem this feels a bit off uh, he might be trying to reroute his knight through g3 to like f5 but if I just go e6 then uh, we control that and if he wants to do something like this, then that seems a bit stupid to me. I don't see what he gains from that. This looks very, very solid. C5 or E5 are probably going to be a pawn break in the future. I'd like to bring my bishop to D6. My queen might go to C7. She might go to B6. I'm going to castle kingside, most likely. Uh, this doesn't scare me. Uh, we have a lot of pieces around my king helping in the in a potential defense. So I'm really not worried. I'm going to go bishop to d6. We have the typical like pyramid formation around the bishop, which makes it very hard for the bishop to actually be challenged, especially because this bishop can't access the a3 or f4 diagonals to challenge me because he committed this pawn to e3 so early on instead of putting the bishop on f4 and then me potentially having to go bishop d6 and trade the bishops which is a very common idea in a lot of caro structures my opponent's just made three moves of his knight so we've played 10 moves so far in this game four of them have been with his knight and he might even play a fifth knight to f4 now we can play e5 in this position which does give up the f5 square potentially but if he goes back to g3, there's no way that's a viable move. I refuse to believe that. Knight e4 is a potential move. Just shoving the knight into his position. But I also don't see a need to rush that. We could go h5 to induce the move g5. Because if we go h5 and he takes, that seems a bit too weakening. Especially after bishop takes, we're lining up a lot of things. But if h5, he could take our bishop. And like I said previously, if bishop takes bishop, I want to take with the h pawn to open up the h file. But if we go h5 and then bishop takes bishop, we have to take that with the f pawn. You could argue our rook could be powerful on the f file. But um, after takes takes, I think white actually is doing all right. I don't believe in our position there. So knight e4 is a good move, e5 is a good move. e5 I think makes, makes the most sense to me, especially because it threatens e4. If we go e5, takes, takes, takes... Wait, <laughs> where am I getting all these takes from? e5, takes, takes... I want to take with the knight, of course, because, like I said, my bishop is incredibly strong in this position because of all my light squared pawns, but also because his bishop can't actually contest me. We also control this e4 break incredibly well, which means it's going to be difficult for him to develop his bishop. I feel like he's played something very wrong here, and all of these knight moves look strange, to say the least. 
It's all H3, G4. I mean, H3 is fine, of course. Just asking the question, am I going to take? But G4 doesn't look correct. I think E5 makes a whole lot of sense. If um takes, takes, and he wants to go knight to F4 attacking my bishop. Mm, I don't know. Whoa. Whoa, really? G4 is technically hanging now because there's a pin on the H-pawn. Mm, I don't know about this. I'm very well developed in this position. I've got all my minor pieces out. Very well situated. I'm striking in the center. I control white's pawn break. He could try c4. That would be his other idea. But I don't believe in it. Especially because of how weak his king side is now. You know, trading the bishops off is fine. Uh, opening my rook up isn't the end of the world. But if you've created a situation where you've got an h3 pawn supporting a weak g4 pawn. But the h3 pawn is weak itself. And, you know, my rook is essentially tying down, like, three different pieces. Two of them are pawns, of course, but my five points of material is kind of constraining seven points of his material. Here, I think it would be stupid to take with the bishop. Mm, yeah, because our bishop's so strong. Knight e5, you might be thinking knight to f4, and if we trade on f3, then the queen defends the knight. You're correct, but I don't see the need to take his knight. Because they're now on f5, because my bishops are now traded, isn't actually doing all that much. Because I control, basically, all of its movement, right? Because of my pawns on the light squares. Sorry, I know, I know that was a bunch of arrows, but I hope you were able to follow along with that. He might be planning on making use of the d4 square. And c5 would kick the knight out. And he doesn't have f5 because we have a pawn controlling that square. But I don't want to give him b5 attacking our bishop. But also remember, g4 is hanging. So we can just take this pawn. Now... I don't know what the knight's doing here. Knight c3, I think, is a terrible move. And um, this actually happened, not this exact position, of course, but a similar idea in a previous episode of the rating climb. So the problem is, I have a big pawn wedge in the center. White's main ideas to break that apart are e4 and c4. As we've established, we have massive control over the e4 square. White's adding a defender, but we already have two there. So, you might think c4 is probably the idea, and I would agree, because if white trades these knights off, then we have one less defender of c4, and we're only down to one, and if he can play a move like queen d3 preparing c4, that makes a lot of sense to me. But he just blocked his c-pawn by moving his knight here, and where is his knight actually going? We control all of these squares quite well, right? Like, we have full control over the knight's movement. If the knight goes to a4, where is it going? We control these squares. So this looks very odd to me. I think we should take the g4 pawn. I'm trying to think which piece I should take it with. I think it makes sense to take with the e knight. Because then our f knight maintains control of e4. Because if we do this, he might be planning e4. And then things kind of blow up a bit. Whereas if we take with this knight and then he goes e4. Then we can probably just take with the pawn and attack this knight. And we're, at, we're just up two pawns. So that looks pretty good to me. Let's do it. I hope I'm not missing anything. Okay, my opponent anticipated it. And he goes queen e2. I don't know what queen e2 does. I guess he's preparing... Oh, he's preparing e4. Okay. But queen e7, I think, just stops that. We're just adding another defender. We're also getting the queen off the d-file, which could be good if he castles queenside. Remember, the knight is not hanging. He still can't take because his rook hangs. Um... I think it would be a bad idea. Well, obviously, if you castle now, then you hang the knight because your rook moves. 
But castling kingside in general feels unnecessarily risky. So we're probably going to go queenside, and I think he is as well. We're up a pawn, but the game is far from over. I really like this move, and I'll explain why. One, now when he castles, his rook's going to be defended by his other rook, and our knight would be under attack. So this is a prophylactic move, because I know my knight is going to be under attack. It's done its job, it's won a pawn, let's get out of there. Okay, so I was offering a trade there. Because we're up a pawn, trades should be favourable to me. And then my bishop has a really nice diagonal. The secondary idea was this c4 square. That if he declines the trade, then I can play knight c4 potentially. He is giving further support for his e4 push right now, which might be his idea. It's worth considering the move rook h5 to attack the knight. If he goes e4 though, his bishop will be defending. However, if we go c4 and he pushes e4, I think we can just take this bishop. I think we can just take this. If he goes e4. Oh, bishop c1. So he defends b2. Maybe he wants to play b3 to kick my um, knight out. But I really like the move queen e5 here. Targeting the knight so that b3 isn't playable. Also attacking this knight. And asking it what it's doing. If I go queen e5, am I worried about f4 attacking my queen and defending his knight? Or do I just claim that's a weakness? And then f5... I think that actually helps him. I think that kind of helps his case. So I don't really want to allow that to be fair. Okay, what about rook h5 attacking the knight? If f4 there, then our queen isn't being hit. So we get an extra move still. And then we can try and exploit the e3 pawn with moves like bishop c5. Although if e4 there, we can't take because our knight will hang. Hmm. Could play e4 immediately because his bishop would, would be defending his knight. Technically b2 would hang because of this sequence of moves, but he doesn't have to take the knight. And then our knight would be quite stranded. Hmm. We could play bishop b4, actually. Ooh, the more I think about it, the more I like that move. That solves a lot of problems. I like that. So don't get me wrong, our bishop was doing a great job. And like I said, I don't really want to trade it off. Because it's, you know, our pawns are controlling the light squares, our bishop's controlling the dark squares, and it's sheltered by the pawns. But... This does prevent b3, because the knight hangs. The knight is also defending the e4 square, and we're pinning the knight to the king. We can take this knight at a second's notice, and if we double his pawns like this, this knight cannot be attacked by this bishop. And it's a beautiful piece. We're also making it very difficult for e4 to be played, because he's losing a defender, and we should just be able to snap it off with knight e4, knight e4, queen e4, queen e4, and d e4. And we can take this knight at a second's notice. If bishop d2 is played, trying to break the pin, then we... Again, b2 hangs, but I don't, I don't want the b2 pawn. Uh, if bishop d2 and we take, then probably queen takes. We could consider the move knight e4. Knight e4 and d e4, opening up the d file for our rook. And we solve the problem of him trying to play e4. Our opponent goes a3. Like I said, I'm going to snap this off, ruin his structure. Our knight is amazing now, because a dark squared bishop can't attack a knight on light squares. The only way to undermine this knight would be to play e4. 
to try and get the D pawn to move and step off of the defense. But, 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 I think we can just go knight e4 in this position. Yep, let's do it. Because we're attacking this knight, so we're kind of forcing it to take. Um, of course, we take with the queen, because if pawn takes, then our knight hangs. And we pressure the rook. e4 is fully under our control now. Our knight's amazing. His bishop is completely locked out of the game, which I guess is one of the problems with the collie system. I'm assuming that my opponent hasn't played it like exactly how it's supposed to be played, because there must be more of an idea than what we got in the game. But this bishop's in jail, and this knight is great. Okay, so his rook was under attack. He moved it to h2, so he maintains defense of the uh, h3 pawn. I think simplest is just to castle. Of course our opponent could try and do this to trade queens, but then his rook would hang at the end of the line. F5 is potentially a move I want to play to add extra support to E4, because like I said, that is his only piece of counterplay. Um, otherwise his bishop is going to struggle to get out. Ah, I think we just actually missed... Um, Queen e5, hitting the rook and the c3 pawn. That 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 was a simple fork. I should have spent a bit longer. Um, yeah, and if queen e5, queen g4 doesn't solve any problems. Oh, it doesn't come with a check anyway. My king's on e8. Yeah, this would have just been winning because I'm attacking this rook. And if this rook moves, or if f4 is played to cut off my queen's attack on the rook, then we can just take c3 and we fork the king and the rook. I just missed that. Um, that's bad. I should have seen it, but okay. That kind of thing happens. This is chess. Um, you're not always going to see the best move, even if it is quite simple. Because in reality, that is a simple move. But I think, like, one, that just demonstrates that... I'm a fairly strong player. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to um toot my own trumpet or whatever, but I am and I'm still missing moves like that occasionally. So there's that. See, so like you don't need to play perfect to be a good player is basically what I'm saying. So queen d3 I think is a good practical move because if I take this queen then I fix his structure, my knight gets booted out of the position that it's in. It still should be winning for me, but it makes my life a whole lot harder because this bishop's going to get out then. I think queen e5 is a far better move because we hit this rook. Yeah, c3 is defended now by the queen, so it's nowhere near as good as it was on the last move, but we're still asking questions of the white position. Now, we know we have a better position, but we need to try and convert this now. We need to try and make improving moves. A move like b5 might look um, appealing to defend the knight, but this would allow massive counterplay with the move a4, trying to open the rook up. So we're not going to do that. Um, you might be thinking queen e4 to try and trade queens, and that would be great. But he's just going to go rook h2 and we have the exact same position as last move. Again, I don't want to do this and fix his pawn structure. So it's difficult for us to play the move d4. Because he has pretty good control of that square. And also our knight would hang, so let's not do that. Ideas of f5 look appealing to me. <clears throat> Just to take more space and try and play f4 in the future. I could also consider queen e6 just going after h3. It's difficult to defend, actually. I'm going to play it. I'm just going to attack this pawn. Like, where are you going to put it? If you advance it, then queen f6? Maybe? Ah, no, if you advance it, then maybe queen back to e4. 
And I told you previously that was no good because rook h2 and we have the same position, but this isn't the same position. If um, h4, queen e4, then I would have been able to take on h4 if we played rook h2. So we went, he goes queen f1. He goes queen f1 to try and guard the pawn. That's an incredibly passive move. It might be the best move, but it's very passive nonetheless. Rook h5 is on my radar because I want to just double up and win this pawn. I think that's the simplest way of winning this position. Just check there's nothing better, I don't think. Well, there might be something better, but I think this is simple. b5 might be an idea because our queen now protects the knight. And remember, this pawn is, Ooh, is pinned. But that kind of seems a bit complicated. Let's just go rook h5. I'm choosing h5 instead of h4, just so there's no ideas of bishop to g5 in the future with some kind of fork. I doubt it would happen, but let's not take risks. Okay, queen g2. That doesn't attack anything that we can't defend. So rook h8 looks good to me. Yeah, he still can't play e4 because we have two attackers. And I don't see how he defends h3. If we just uh, take, 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 trade everything off, then we're going to win. But if we take, take, and take, he probably won't trade queens because, of course, you know, that would be kind of suicide. I'm kind of tempted to play this. Or this. Wait, if I go queen e5, how does he defend c3? I guess he could do this maneuver. But then we trade queens and win h3. Um, okay, what about queen e4? No, why would I do that? No, I think I like this move. C3, I, I think this is the only v valid way to defend it. Okay, now we just take the bishop though, right? Do we want to take the bishop? Actually. I mean, I knew bishop d2 was a thing, but I didn't think it was actually playable. Do we want to take it? Take, take. C3 is defended. I knew this move existed, but I didn't think it was that good. Okay. Okay, let's play quickly. Let's just go queen f4. f5 even. Let's just go queen f5. Eyeing up a bunch of weak squares. Again, e4 isn't playable. We just take it. If he queenside castles, I feel like he must be getting mated. If we can transfer our queen over. Ah, so now he's blundered a rook. Because we can just take that and then win his rook once his h-pawn moves. I guess our, pa our patience pays off. Although, of course, there was no need for my opponent to do that. And it's actually worse because after he takes and we take, the only move is king e2 and then we win this rook. And... We're up two rooks, that's game over. Uh, that's a very interesting game. I don't think I've played against the Collie system in a very long time. This whole idea of his to go h3 and g4, it seemed very weird, and the computer agrees with me. The eval bar goes way in my, not way in my favor, but in my favor after this push. I'll be interested to see what he should have done on his side, what the plans of the collie system should have been. And I'm sure I've gone wrong in places because I don't really know how to play this structure. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the game. If you're not subscribed to the channel already, I'd really appreciate you hitting the sub button so I can show up in your feed more often and you can get more useful chess content to help you improve your game. And if you're already subscribed, please drop a like, get involved in the conversation in the comments. But most of all, thank you very much for being subscribed. Let's get into the game analysis. I think this is going to be quite interesting. 
Okay, so I've done a bit of digging into the collie system, and I believe, right, we're just going to set up a position here um, in the collie, and so e3 is kind of the point. The point is that you're not going to develop your bishop first before locking it in, and you're going to play e3 straight away. So what I gathered is this whole bishop d3 idea. Yeah, that's the point. You're kind of uh, providing an umbrella for your bishop, just like we did in the game. And let's set something like this up. These moves aren't going to be perfect, but just for the sake of argument. Um, just demonstrate something like h3, bishop here. So I believe the idea of the collie system is you play e3. You put your bishop on d3 and you put this knight on d2 and then you push e4 and then when you make e4 happen your bishop is going to be reactivated just later on right rather than doing it early now if e4 isn't possible for whatever reason i've seen some recommendations of going b3 and putting the bishop on b2 but the main idea is to play e4 which is why i was very happy with the way that i handled the position if we just fast forward a little bit don't worry i'll go a bit more in depth in a minute so i'm quite happy with the way that i handled the position trying to maintain massive control of the e4 square because i thought if he goes e4, then he breaks out a bit. But if he can't go e4, this bishop's going to be stuck. And that bishop did remain stuck the rest of the game, right? Um, I don't think either of us handled the opening amazingly well. Clearly, I ended up like on with with the better position after the opening. But I didn't understand the plans apart from I assumed white wants to play an eventual e4, which he did. So the collie system, it does actually look quite interesting. Um, but our opponent just misplayed it. So bishop d3, bishop g4. Like I said, here I could have played bishop to g4, but I assumed my opponent... Uh, I mean, he wasn't necessarily going to play bishop to e2. You don't need to do that. But it gave him the option to go bishop to e2. So I thought it would make more sense to develop my knight first, see where he's going to put his bishop, and then commit my bishop so that he can't play bishop e2 without just wasting a tempo. This wouldn't be a very good move. Because it kind of means that I'm playing with the white pieces because I'm up a tempo. I start the game down half a tempo because I'm black. I go up a tempo if we get this kind of position. So I'm essentially playing white now. And in the same vein... If my opponent had gone bishop e2 for whatever reason, then I was going to play bishop to f5 to take hold of this diagonal. And then if my opponent plays bishop to d3, again, he wastes a tempo. And I'm basically playing with the white pieces. So, all that to say, my opponent goes knight bd2. This is all very standard. Um, h3 is fine. I can take this knight, but I didn't see the need to. Um... His bishop is incredibly strong if I lose my bishop. And after bishop to h5, I also have the option of going bishop g6 whenever I want. What I didn't expect is for him to make me go bishop g6. It's just not a good move because after bishop g6, if you take me, again, we have the problems that white has the problems that we saw happen in the game. This pawn is hanging. And if, after bishop to g6, my opponent goes for g5, I can put my knight on h5, I can put my knight on e4, I can take his bishop. This isn't scary. He has no follow-up, right? I think the best move here is queen to e2, defending this bishop, so that if I trade, you don't have to take with the pawn. But this is a very easy position to play. Like I say, if white ever takes, I take back with the h-pawn. And, oh, queen e2 also helps prepare e4. Essentially, white needs to play e4. And he didn't. After bishop g6, he goes knight f1. And after I saw this move, it was just like something was up. There was something wrong. 
Now, I now know it's because he should have been trying to control the e4 square and playing e4 to open this bishop up, and then this position makes more sense. Now, if I were to take this um, bishop, I kind of lose a bit of my advantage because I think c4 is going to come. My position's fine. Like, he still can't play e4 yet, and the computer literally wants to put this knight back on d2 so that he can play e4. Because that looks to be the idea of the collie system. But um, yeah, we don't take. We go e6. Because like I said, if he ever takes, we just take back with the h-pawn. And we're good. So my opponent goes knight to g3 instead. Which, I mean, he's not going anywhere. He's controlling the e4 square, I suppose. But we have bishop to d6. Now, bishop d6 is by far the best move in this position. Because if you play, I don't know, rook c8, preparing a move like c5 in the future, right? I don't know if you can go e4 yet, because you still don't have enough defenders. But after a move like queen e2, then you are preparing e4. And again, if I play some kind of waiting move, you can probably play it. And just for the sake of argument, if everything was traded... White's doing well. Like, the position's still better for me, apparently. But White's okay. His bishop gets out, he can castle, and the game goes on. But bishop d6 is a problem. Because if he ever tries to play e4, I'm going to snap this knight off, removing a defender, and then it's going to be very difficult for him to have enough defenders on the e4 square. Like I say, this game is a battle for e4, and I think my opponent must have known this, because he's strong, right? He's rated over 1800, and he plays the collie system. Um, and like I say, I don't really understand the collie. I think I do now. And it actually looks like quite an interesting opening, to be fair. But he just couldn't make e4 happen. Like in this position, knight d2 is the best move according to the computer. Just trying to play e4. And after a move like rook c8, just for example, I assume queen e2 is good. No? Is e4 not a move? Oh... I have e5. Apparently I have e5 here. And if d takes, then knight takes, o, oh, and then we have this. And this is just very good for me. And if he takes like this, then we have e4 into mezzo attacking the bishop. If he takes here, that doesn't work because we attack his queen. So if he plays a move like bishop to c4. Uh, we have e3 even. You can't take because you're going to get pinned. And this doesn't work because I just take that. Very interesting line. So knight f3. Then we take here. Bishop back to d3. Queen a5. There's no bishop d2. There's no knight d2. There's no queen d2 because our pawn controls that square. Basically it can get very bad very quickly for white is what I'm saying. My opponent goes knight e2 though, which, I mean, this knight has just done a massive dance around the board. I said, like, he spent his first five moves, move, sorry, he spent five of his first ten moves moving the knight. That's not healthy. And I go e5, which is a mistake. So, queen e7 is apparently better. And I wonder why. So, let's say knight f4, which I thought was the idea to go after my bishop. e5 here is apparently better. If takes, 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 just for the sake of argument, and knight takes, do we take with the queen now? No, you still take with the bishop. I don't see what the difference is between this variation and what we did in the game. Because the difference is a queen's on e7, but I don't see how that changes anything. Maybe f4 was a problem? Whereas here f4 isn't playable, because we have a pin on the e3 pawn. Whereas here, takes, takes, let's just say everything gets traded, is the idea f4. 
Ah, so f4, and if I move the bishop, then I get my bishop trapped, which isn't good. And if I take on d3, I can't do this because of knight e4? I mean, you're actually getting mated, probably. If this, then like, this is just mate. And if queen takes, check, king here, and then I win the queen. So, if you then take this instead, a knight e4 is still an idea with the same sort of threat of queen h4. But let's say that wasn't a thing. C takes controlling this square. Then bishop c7. And white's okay. White actually has quite a healthy pawn center here. So if he had taken, it's better to take with the bishop. It's better to take with the bishop because if knight takes, knight takes. If you go f4, I, I still have this idea. Okay, interesting. But I could do this. Go h5. G5, let's say, knight d7. The position's still good for me. I think, basically, e5 is a mistake because there is one way out of the position for white and he has to be incredibly accurate. And it's still a good position for me even if he finds this specific line. But he doesn't. He takes on g6. I guess he was scared of e4 and he, like, e4 would uh, fork the knight and the bishop, and he just didn't want to take me, which is understandable. So he trades on g6, of course we take back, and we open our rook up, he takes on e5, we take on e5, knight c3, big mistake, I said in the game it's definitely a mistake. If we traded on e5, we wouldn't have time to play knight g4 yet, and best move here is f3, just defending g4. Even though it weakens the dark squares a lot, the knight currently covers it. Queen e7 is good, castle. This is a very easy position for black to play, but I guess white can claim that he is solid and that he can try and defend this. My opponent though goes knight c3, and like I said, this knight has no future. He's blocking his own c4 move, so I wasn't a fan of this. I take on g4. Apparently this is a slight inaccuracy and it was better to take with the f knight. But I thought e4 was a little bit dangerous because if I would take this, yeah, the computer agrees with me. White is sort of fighting back. But the computer claims that queen f6 is better going after this knight. And if you take here, oh, then, then I have mate. So the knight is literally pinned to f2. That's interesting. The knight is pinned to f2, and the h3 pawn is pinned to the rook. So the best move is king f1. <laughs> okay, okay. So white loses a piece if I see this very intricate line. I didn't see that, so I took with the e knight instead. So I maintained control over e4. If e4 is played in this position, Again, it isn't even best to take. It's better to play moves like bishop c5 going after, or queen b6 going after f2. If I were to take this, though, the position is still very good for me. This knight is under attack. If this knight tries to move, queen b6, bishop e5. Again, this knight is not takeable because it's pinned to the rook. The, well, the pawn is pinned to the rook. So this was my idea. And although it might not be the absolute perfect way to go about the position. I think it makes a lot of sense. So I took on g4 like this. My opponent goes queen e2, which is the best move, is actually the best move, because he's trying to make e4 happen. I go queen e7, which is good, again, just making sure e4 can't get played. My opponent goes bishop to d2. I go knight e5, which I was happy with. King f8 is apparently slightly better, but there's no reason for me to be playing that. Because you don't want to be castling kingside here, because your rook's doing a great job on this file. 
but queenside, I guess, isn't completely safe. So the computer wants to put the king on f8 because we are safe on the king's side, but we want to keep this rook on the h file. Either way, I go this route and I think it's perfectly fine. Knight g5 is a mistake. So the reason I go knight e5 is because if you trade knights with me here, remember, I'm up a pawn and, and I have a lot of pressure in the position. My idea was to take with the bishop, and I thought my bishop was putting some excellent pressure on his position if he tries to go f4 to kick my bishop out. Apparently, I can just take on c3 and go knight e4, and this knight is completely unassailable. I've got ideas of queen to h4 potentially as well. So let's say something like bishop g7. I can just attack the bishop first even, and when the bishop retreats, I well, I actually have this fork, but I also have queen to h4. And when the king moves, knight f2 check wins the exchange. So knight g5 is a mistake. Well, sorry, that was my idea if he takes on e5, but he doesn't. And um, of, I'm kind of threatening to take him anyway. But more than that, if he wasn't going to accept, let's say he castled queenside here, then my idea was knight c4. And if you try and play b3, oh, you can't actually take the knight. I can actually just queenside castle because if you take, you are getting mated. Because um, the b file is cleared, which is interesting. But my idea was simply to put a ton of pressure on his queenside. And b3, even if my knight ended up getting kicked out, let's say something like this happens and I do move my knight, then the dark squares are incredibly weak anyway. So worst case scenario, it was still very good for me. So I played it. Or well, that was my idea, which is what actually happened anyway after he moved his knight, which is the best move. My opponent goes bishop c1. His bishop is controlling my knight's forward movement, which, you know, with these two squares in between the bishop and knight is a very typical geometric idea. But it's more so the bishop being dominated by the knight than the other way around, because I can always reroute my knight somewhere else or add extra attackers to the dark squares, whereas his bishop is just blocking the development of his rook and making it so his king can't get to safety. And if his king can't get to safety and this rook can't develop, then this rook is going to be stuck for defenders, meaning this h-pawn is going to remain pinned and, you know, the problems just compile. So bishop e4 is the best move. I'm very happy I found that. Queenside castle is perfectly valid. Again, king f8 is a decent move. What else was I considering in this position, though? Because I was finding it difficult to break through this. I think I was considering rook, a, rook to h5 to attack the knight, but then e4, and this was my issue. I can't take this because my knight hangs. So I here bishop b4 is a move, bishop e5 is also a move. But okay, yeah, it it's just a bit more complicated because he's actually breaking out of the position a bit and putting a lot of pressure on me. So bishop e4 is the best, because now e4 isn't really playable. So I just take, and then I take, and then if we trade everything, then I'm absolutely good. I'm up two pawns, his structure is ruined, my knight is amazing. It doesn't even have a guard on it, and it's still impossible to kick out, and I have full faith I convert this position. Not least because I'm up two pawns, but my knight is amazing, my rook's putting a lot of pressure on, his pawn structure is ruined. So he goes a3, of course we take, which is by far the best move, because like I said, I want to remove defense of e4, and I also want to ruin his pawn structure. I was expecting him to maybe go bishop d2, because I wasn't really planning on taking on b2. It's not amazing, it's playable, but I was probably just going to take on d2, and if queen takes d2... Oh, and I can, I can attack this knight, because if this knight moves, then this is a very powerful move. Putting an absolute ton of pressure on his position. And the computer literally wants to give up. <laughs> like, give up a knight, which is quite funny. And if queen d3, queen f6, 
setting up a nice little double attack. And you can't play this because I assume I take on f2 and you're probably going to get slaughtered. So, anyway, we take on c3 after he provokes us with a3. We play knight e4, which is fine. Queen e5 is better, though. I missed this move with just a simple double attack. Uh, this is probably playable in a few positions, but knight e4 is fine. I offer him a knight trade. He accepts it. Rook h2, and like I say, queen e5, I just missed, is completely winning, attacking the rook, attacking c3. If you save the rook, then I take on c3, and the king moves, and we take the rook. If you move the bishop to defend, then again, I just take the rook. And it's completely game over. I'm up a rook and two pawns. And I'm probably going to force even more trades like this. And it's, you know, it's impossible to lose this, really. Even I wouldn't find a way to lose this. But I, I missed it. I queenside castled. And my opponent goes queen d3. Which is a very good move. Because if I take this, I'm still winning. But a lot of my advantage slips. My knight gets kicked out of the position. His bishop can now develop. I've got a ton of pressure still. Like I'm threatening some infiltrations. I saw this line. And I was like. We don't actually have anything here. We're still a pawn up. We're still better. But it's nowhere near as convincing. So here we go queen e5. And c3 is defended. So it's nowhere near as good. But it's still good. Rook h1. We go queen e6. Just attacking h3. And actually rook to um, rook h4 is the best move in this position. I guess controlling e4 and preparing to double up. Which is kind of what we did afterwards anyway. We go rook to h5. Queen g2. Rook h... Rook there. Rook h8. a4. A4, I guess, prepares bishop A3, trying to get the bishop into the game. And if we would take, then I guess he might be trying to trade off. But we're still completely winning, no doubt. But I guess he gets rid of his bad bishop and my good knight. We get queen E5, just attacking C3, bishop D2. For some reason, bishop D2 just skipped my mind a bit. I thought he had to go queen G4 and queen to D4 to defend. And here I was just going to trade and take on h3. And yes, I fix his pawn structure. But to me, this was completely winning. Because not only am I up two pawns, and my knight is absolutely amazing still. But it, he can't actually move. If bishop d2, then rook h1. Rook h1, and I win the rook. If bishop 2, b2, I just take the bishop. If bishop a3, then again, rook 2, h1 wins the rook. So the only move is king e2, not to get back ranked. But I can still play rook h1. And if you go bishop b2, I can't take the bishop because then he takes my rook. But I can force a trade of rooks. And this bishop can't do a single thing against this knight. If I play a move like f5, controlling the e4 square, this should be a very easy conversion. So... He played bishop d2. Anyway, that was the reason that I played queen e5, because I was expecting all of that to play out. We have this, and I was like, huh, I actually don't want to take this. And I was correct in saying that. It's not good to take it. Because the king actually does quite a good job of defending stuff, and it's difficult for me to add further attackers. So instead I thought, okay, I'll keep my really good knight on the board. I'll play queen f5, and I'll just target the weaknesses. And it's difficult for white to move here. It's good to castle queenside, which I think is what I was expecting. I was considering moves like d4 to try and get my queen over to the queenside somehow, but it just doesn't work. So here I was just going to take on h3. And let's just say for the sake of argument, I can trade everything off here. It's similar to the previous position where everything gets traded, except... My opponent has queenside castled in this position. So it's not quite as bad for him. But he still has no real counterplay. Rookie one. I'm not even going to take this bishop. Because my knight is just so much better. I can put pressure on his position. If he goes e4. F2 hangs. If he goes for a move like rookie two defending. Then he can't move. I can just push my ball into his position. 
and it's very very t tricky for him to actually do anything f5 is the move i would probably play here just to make sure e4 never happens and the computer literally just wants to sacrifice the pawn which is how bad the situation is my opponent goes queen g4 though which i mean i'm obviously going to take that because if h takes then rook h1 king moves i take the other rook i'm just up two clean rooks so my opponent blunders at the end but i think we had the right ideas anyway because if we go up two pawns in this end game it's completely winning and even if these minor pieces got traded off his pawn structure is a lot worse and i'm just up two pawns but really my knight completely dominates his bishop so every single end game benefits me because he just can't move his bishop and my knight can't be moved right so yeah that is essentially the slav defense versus the collie system i think i learned an awful lot about how to play against the collie in that it kind of like somewhat tempts me to play the collie i'm an e4 player so i will not be playing that but it looks like a pretty valid opening if you play it correctly um so yeah uh i hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to see this series continue trying to push 2100 please let me know in the comment section uh, if I've missed anything stupid during the game or any of you have a particular insight into the Collie system, please let me know. With that being said, I hope you have a good one and I'll see you in the next video.